before I start, um, we've all kind of eaten together now and been part of some kind of weird user research about homeless consumption. <laughs> um, so I'll probably complain with you. Like, the title as advertised is, is Everyone and I A, but I'm kind of conscious of like the feelings that I evoke in the presentations that I deliver. And um, I don't want to lie to you, so yes. Um, <laughs> Everyone is an IA. This, this isn't like, there's no dramatic tension, so don't feel anxious during this. Um, but when I kind of came up with the title and emailed it through, I wasn't kind of as sure as I am now. But writing this presentation kind of convinced me, um, and hopefully I'll convince you too, um, through some jazzy transitions. Um, so if everyone's sitting comfortably, which we're not, so I'll just, uh, otherwise this line won't work. <laughs> Well, some of us are sitting comfortably, so I'll begin. Uh, hello, this is the real start of it. I am Dan Anderson, and I am an information architect. And that's a fairly easy introduction to make, especially to a room full of people who turn up to World AA Day. But that sentence, I'm an information architect, I think it's harder to say in other settings. It's harder to say in front of family at Christmas. I've got this uncle, and he looks exactly like that, and he's like always willing to ruin a family party but like insisting that it's not a real job. And he gets quite strident about that. Um, and when I was thinking of like the theme for this talk, and I was thinking about Christmas, it kind of occurred to me that, you know, the theme of today's um, World AA Day is architecting happiness. And I thought that the world would be a happier place if that sentence was easier to say, and if more people said it more regularly. And this talk's not all about my imaginary uncle, genuinely think that the world would be a happier place if more people thought of themselves as contributing to the information architecture that surrounds us. Because, and maybe it's all the syllables, but I think there's like, I think people think information architecture is complicated, perhaps um, often more complicated than it needs to be. And I suspect that it's not just me with the constant baiting of an imagined father's brother that has you know, a hard time when I try to talk about information architecture and find a way to get it done. I think there's often a perception that because it requires a level of specialization to do the most complicated types of IA, um, that people get nervous. There's like feelings of anxiety when people approach information architecture. No one likes to feel out of their depth. And I think IA, really great IA, requires a depth of thinking that deserves justification an explanation. Because even when you've built kind of trust with other disciplines and colleagues and clients, I think you know, in the back of their heads, most of the time when we're talking about information architecture, a lot of them are thinking, is it really that complicated? And I think if we can kind of spread a way of thinking about information architecture more generally, um, we can encourage people to architect things from the ground up. Last year, um, Throwing that one and it had like a went like that and then that's happened. Don't worry, I mean we're a little ahead of where we should be. <laughs> now we're back. Uh, forget this happened. <laughs> but remember it in the future and say, oh it's great when that thing came on. And then I like the picture of the dragon. Um, and now we rejoin the presentation. <laughs> so last year I stood like here, I think, um, and I talked about um, how IA is a designers too. And how there's this like, concept of um, an IA mindset. I was talking then about how I think information architects have got like, cool stuff to bring throughout the design process. We've got skills and stuff to bring, you know, regardless of where you are in that process. Last year, I was talking about that from like, an IA perspective. And I suppose this year, I've decided just to recycle those ideas. But I've got some more transitions and some <coughs> pictures this time. I'm saying more or less exactly the same thing. But this year, I'm not too worried about us. We're the cool kids. I'm worried about kind of how we can encourage designers to adopt that mindset and make information architecture a more natural style of thinking for all UX disciplines. I think if we can kind of architect a situation in which everyone who works in UX feels comfortable talking about and thinking about IA, we can architect a happier world for everyone. Because I think this is our biggest problem and challenge that faces us. We're the minority. Remember this slide, it's great. <laughs> this is um, the UCUX and D team. There are 140 of us. 
Um, and that's representative of like the IA specialists. We're outnumbered kind of roughly one to ten <coughs> in the organization. Um, and I don't think that's unique. I think a lot of the time IAs don't work together and not every project gets an IA on it, um, although every project could probably benefit from that thinking. And this is what troubled me. Kind of information architecture is everywhere. It's part of every project. Every design includes it. How could I make sure that it's always designed? My solution to this is simple. We become the majority. And because I can't do that just by recruiting 140 IAs, we do it another way. We turn everyone in the team into that 140 team into an information architect. And I get that this is a bit contentious. There's legitimate certainty that IA is a specialism and that there's dangers in diluting that specialism and kind of dumbing down. But last year I talked about that IA mindset, a way of approaching any design challenge from an IA perspective. I talked then about like just switching your brain and thinking a bit more like an information architect. I don't think we're that special. I think anyone can adopt that way of thinking. And we know the benefits on offer when every design does start from the architecture up. Well-architected things work better. They're more efficient, connected, resilient, <coughs> and meaningful. They're more useful. They make people happier. I think if we can encourage designers to adopt IA as a second language, or maybe even a first language, so they consider stuff from an IA perspective before they apply their, the skills that they're more comfortable <coughs> with, we can all make better things. I think it was probably autumn last year when I started thinking about trees. It's a good line, isn't it? Um, and I started thinking, especially about kind of roots. Roots are usually shallow, especially compared to the height of the tree. But they're broad and they support the structure. And I thought about whether if we could give every designer in the team a broad, shallow dose of IA thinking, then we'd be on the right course to deliver better designs. We'd still have specialists and they'd be kind of the trunks of the tree. And they'd do like heavy lifting and make sure the structural bits of information architecture at the BBC was working most efficiently. And then because we've got those roots and the trunks, we can blossom into a beautiful BBC with the best information architecture there can possibly be. So I had this idea, I had like a picture of a tree. All I then needed to do was convince 120 designers that they're really information architects. And I suppose the million dollar question is, how do you do that? Well, of course I've got this whole wizard thing going on, so I use magic. Um, so I've got a deck of cards here, we'll get to that in a second. I just need someone to uh, shout out, choose a card, any card. Um, there, with the Mac laptop, I can see. Uh, two of spades. Two of spades, you don't want to change your mind, do you? Because uh, no. you can change your mind. <laughs> you don't want to change your mind. Damn it. <laughs> uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, in this pack, there is one card that is reversed. Um, there it is. One card reversed. What was the card you named? Uh, two of spades. Yeah, it's not the two of spades. It's <laughs> joking. Don't worry, there's no need for nervousness. I meant to do that. Because um, we can't rely on magic. Magic doesn't work. That's kind of not what information architecture is about. That's not how that we can convince 120 people just to adopt a different way of seeing the world. But if we try persuasion, persistence and patience, then maybe we can convince the world that the way we see the world has real value. Most magic is just lots of hard work and some invisible wires. I didn't fly here today, I came on a train and it wasn't even a tiny cool train that goes inside a building. It wasn't even a magic train full of child wizards. It was a normal train, so it smelled a little bit, and it was cramped. That's what the real world's like. It's kind of cramped. You're just sat at a desk doing work, drinking tea, eating biscuits. It's still cool, but it's a world in which we're probably living with a, a 10 to 1 minority of IAs, and that's like in a perfect world. We're always going to be a, in a minority. And we, but if we can encourage more people to adopt that mindset, we can flip that ratio. We can live in a world where people are taming the information around them and untangling and controlling messes that they thought were beyond them. It's down to us to make this happen because things have changed and things will continue to change. 
There were the like, glory days in the past, a fairly static web publishing, where everything that we knew from library science gave us clues about how to build these virtual structures online. But then things got more dynamic, and we started to have to adapt to the shifting meaning in like, digital products. The taxonomic structures that we'd been so reliant on in the past became inverted by the prevalence of search engines. And then we got new technologies like linked data and ontologies, and now, now we've got new publishing technologies, and we've got new apps that make utility just as important as the content and context that used to form those like three-circle Venn diagrams that we used to like put in presentations before we had pictures of wizards. <laughs> IA extends into and through our experiences. Maybe it always did, but now it's hard to picture a digital experience that isn't fundamentally reliant on the information architecture that exists. Our discipline is indivisibly intertwined from the rest of the elements of user experience. Experiences are suspended in the architecture that surrounds them. It's as if that ice that the polar bear used to kind of walk around on has melted and it's presented loads of opportunities and challenges to us. And I think what we probably need to do is stop worrying about the minority, stop worrying about the specialism, and start worrying about the majority, the people in the lowlands who will drown first under the kind of weight of information that's coming at us. Because information <coughs> is everywhere. Every designer handles it and creates structures and architectures out of it. There's a quote that I like from a book called The Reflective Practitioner, and it kind of talks about two modes in professional life. It talks about like a high, hard ground, where competent professionals can apply theory as technique and um, operate with skill and proficiency. It's cool up there on a high, hard ground. Um, you're kind of in your comfort zone, but it's hard to deliver a significant value, but there are real dangers of being up there and kind of not knowing what you're doing. And then there's the swampy lowland, where the route towards progress is even more confusing and less certain, where you're less sure of your footing, but where experts can operate with skill and confidence and deliver real value. I think this is the challenge that stands in front of us, to pull designers onto that high, hard ground of creating information architecture with confidence, because IA is now a part of their job. And it's not selfish to pull them up there. I mean, it is selfish, because when they're on the high, hard ground of creating intentional information architecture, it frees us up to go down and explore and have fun in the swamp. We're freed up to solve the big problems. You know, New York used to be a swamp. All it took was some architects to make it into a pretty cool place. And that's how we think about information architecture at the BBC. Not exactly about like, New York and all that stuff. But we think about it as doing three things. I lead a team of UXAs. You met Emily, she's a member of the team. And we're user experience architects. We do information architecture. We're information architecture specialists. But we don't just do IA. We do three things. And the first one is what I'm talking about today. We encourage everyone else in UX and D to create intentional information architecture. Of course, we also do the IA. Emily's talked about the cards work. We've got specialists who are you know, wrangling the messy problems. And we're increasingly the team that operate outside of those vertical structures that Emily talked about to deliver connected experiences across everything that the BBC has to offer. But to give us time to do that, to innovate and to create the fundamentally organization changing information architecture that will deliver genuine value to the audience. We need to free up the time of the designers. We need to convince them that they're part of the solution because the only other thing to be is part of the problem. <coughs> so I've started spreading the word. In December, we got all 140 of us together and I said that everyone creates information architecture and problems occur and opportunities are missed when the structures that are created are unintentional architecture, the result of other design decisions rather than conscious choices about the implied information architecture. I, um, I talked about how when bits of information are combined, that combination affects the information and the meaning. I showed them this picture, um, which I like, and it shows just how easy it is to become an in unintentional architect. Because these two <laughs> adverts appear side by side, the no polls required tent advert takes on a different meaning, and possibly the UK poster does. Now, of course, it's election season, and I'm from the BBC, so other political parties are available. <coughs> I love this, and I, I genuinely love examples like this. I, I like this unintentional Venn diagram. 
So I doubt Reuters wanted to imply so little intersection between those kind of laws and ambitions and their values, but they did. And when you show this to designers, they start to understand that they're playing with information all the time. The more you enter into these conversations, the more they get that they're information architects too. This is brilliant. <laughs> Because they chose four tiles rather than like squares rather than rectangles, it's just like, where the hell? Where should they go? And it's a brilliant metaphor for the how the kind of can a shape of things curtail a designer's ability to make something meaningful. Because in both the, the virtual world and the physical world, there are shapes, atoms, molecules, feeds, components, the things that we play with. But in the real world, there are clues that help you to work out what you're supposed to do. You might work out that this is a corridor and that the odd numbers and the even numbers are on either side of the corridor and that kind of explains the otherwise confusing overlap of spans. But when you're in the digital world of like apps and websites, it's often more difficult to give users those clues and affordances, especially if the IA you're creating isn't really considered. The real world can be really confusing too, don't get me wrong, like, I don't know what led to that. <laughs> it's just really confusing. <laughs> I can't imagine, like, well, uh, they built extensions, or, I don't know. Um, and some things just, like, kind of feel intuitive, like they were designed for a someone rather than a system. And then at other times it just looks like it was designed for a system. And people have kind of assumed that the interaction will speak for itself and it'll be meaningful. But when you wrap it around some other components and other architecture, it becomes really confusing to do. At other times, there's a choreography within a design that ensures usability. Good IA creates this sense of being designed for you. I'm not a massive fan of the word intuition. I think kind of intuitive design hides too much effort. It sounds too much like relying on magic. And given what happened earlier, I'm not a massive fan of magic. Let's stick with it, I'll give it another go. So earlier on we had um, a card chosen, it was, what was the card? The uh, two of spades. Don't worry, no pressure. But just try and take the two of spades out of this pack. Choose any card. Don't look at it yet, because that would ruin the dramatic tension. <laughs> so we're looking for the two of spades. <clears throat> Um, in a loud, proud voice, this is going to be amazing, so, like, what did you pick? Three of clubs. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, you see, you can't rely on magic. But we all know that, like, creativity and user experience, it's not based on magic. It's based on, like, process and discipline. Without having considered the architecture, you leave too much down to chance. It's like that poorly conceived magic trick that went wrong. You've got like a 1 in 52 chance of creating something meaningful. That lift control fails because people assume that the interaction was intuitive, forgetting that it would exist in its next largest context. And something, so something kind of easy as selecting your floor became really difficult. Good IA would have made it more achievable and sometimes good IA just makes what seemed difficult more achievable. We'll try another experiment and this time it's not relying on magic, so it should work. Um, everyone can have a go at this time. I'm going to show you some numbers, and I'd like you to remember how many there are, what they are, and the order they appear in. If you get all three, there is no prize. How many did you get? Got a few, probably, but it was pretty difficult because I hadn't done any information architecture. I had kind of made it difficult. This time, I'm going to show you exactly the same amount of information but I'm going to have done some IA on it. I always forget how many clicks are in this thing. <laughs> that tension. It was easy that time. And that's all that we do as information architects. Even when we're doing the most complex IA imaginable, all of IA is basically doing is creating the right context, thinking for the user so that when they get to the thing that we've designed, it's already kind of semi thought through. They don't have to decode it before they use it. And maybe that's what we need to do to IA sometimes. We need to make it make sense to the people that we work with and sell it to. We need to make them feel confident and happy. 
We need to communicate the process and the recommendations that emerge from that IA process with that sort of clarity. We need to do IA to IA. Because I'm not sure anything is intuitive without conscious decisions going into it at some point. And we need to think about how we talk about IA and how we encourage others to think about it. Because IA is a bit like magic. It's not a like, tenuous metaphor. Great IA is invisible. We spend a long time making sure that IA isn't boiled down to wireframes. We want to get rid of them, remember? And we make sure that, yeah, and we make sure that, um, you know, people understand that answers are usually contingent, and we work hard to make sure that people know that design work isn't just all Photoshop layers. Some great design work is just thinking, and a lot of great IA is just thinking really hard about something. But the problem is that thinking can too often be invisible. Just like magic, the technique of a lot of great IA becomes invisible, steeped in mystery. We need to make it visible. If magic is about making the possible seem impossible, IA is about defining and extending the possible. And we can do this out in the open. There's no need for like a coven of secrecy. We need to be sharing, because our power isn't based on secrets. Our power will be built on cooperation. So we need to share our techniques. We need to make sure that designers think about the structural implications of the skeletal and surface designs that they're creating. We should be boiling down IA to its basic principles and making sure that everyone takes a little time at the start of their process to think about the parts in play, the architecture that will either support or inhibit their designs. Everyone can be an IA, we just need to share it and keep it simple. Every design creates information architecture, every system, interface, service, product, app is surrounded by context. It exists, there's no use ignoring it, because when we ignore it and we try to design something, we just, we're just going to create unintentional architecture. You know, if you're a designer and you don't consider the IA, you're going to create a UKIP poster that ends up next to an advert for tents, metaphorically speaking. You might not do it literally. And not all information architecture is created equal. There's still a need for specialisms. We still need experts. But I think the experts should be talking about IA in the same terms as the novice. I think we should be talking about principles as de delivering benefits to users by making things more meaningful. I think IA defines problems and spaces before design can solve them. So IA is a necessary condition for great design. So every designer should consider it. We can't berate designers if we don't approach the problem of communicating it with clarity and with the same dedication that we show to the other product, projects that we do. I don't think all the biggest challenges for IA are like evolving our techniques to cope with a world made out of information. I think it's getting people on our side to recognize that wealth of information and recognize that there are tools pre-existing to help organize and arrange it. For non-specialists, great IA can look like magic. So it's hard to understand how it's done, how the principles can be applied to any design challenge. My failed experiments with the, the two of spades and the three of clubs they show that you can't rely on magic. It doesn't work. IA isn't intuitive to everyone. Explaining IA is a part of doing IA. We make sense. And we do it um, by convincing people to be part of that discussion, to consider the parts in play. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I've got like, these IA inspiration cards. They're kind of designed to get IAs and stuff. I really want to make some cards that talk about how to adopt the IA mindset and think about it from, for beginners. So there's like a link at the end of this. Um, there's a form on my website. You could all contribute to that project. That would be great. Uh, I've also got some badges that are left over from our um, UX and DOA day when I talk to those 140 designers. They say everyone is an information architect. So if I've convinced you, you can wear a badge that proclaims it. Um, and that's the end of my talk. And I'm kind of conscious that um, like the feeling in the room is a bit like, oh. And I was kind of, I just saw Emily's um, <laughs> presentation. And um, I saw that, like, the picture of Maya Angelou. And it reminded me of that quote that kind of people will forget what you say and they'll forget what you do. But they'll remember how you made them feel. And I suppose this talk fundamentally is about us making kind of UX designers and anyone in the world feel more confident about doing information architecture. That's the message that I really want people to go and 
take away with them. Um, but then I became kind of aware that I probably left you with um, a little disillusioned that there's no magic left in the world. Um, so, so I suppose the final message is don't rely on magic, but don't dismiss it completely. Because no one wants to live in a world without magic. Thanks. And there's a renewed um, kind of commitment amongst the specialist IEs in the BBC to do this thing. It's not like we don't, I'm not just coming to external events and trying to sell the idea. We're going to try and do it in 2015. So there's those, um, there's like the inspiration cards that I've done. You can read about them on my website. There's, we're also going to be releasing more of our techniques. There's a new gel website from the BBC, Global Experience Language, that is in the works at the moment. That will probably launch towards the end of the year, but that will have like our design patterns on, but also our processes. So we really want to share how we do this. Um, we haven't got all the answers, but we've got like a commitment to explore the best ways of doing it. Um, and because we're the BBC, we'll share it with everyone else, because that's kind of partly why we exist. <laughs>